Sunderland are a massive football club. In the Championship, they average an attendance of over 38,000 fans, which is higher than half of the Premier League clubs do right now. Being a big club doesn't guarantee you stability though, and Sunderland fans have gone through their fair share of heartache over the years. In today's video, we're going to explore Sunderland's downfall, how they ended up in League One for so long, and why they are now on their way back to the top. We'll start our story in the summer of 2009. Sunderland had just about scraped survival in the 2008-9 season, beating the drop by just two points. Steve Bruce was appointed as the club's manager in the summer, and they wasted no time in getting several key signings over the line. Most notably, the likes of Darren Bent, Lee Catamull and Fraser Campbell all signed for the club this summer. Darren Bent went on to score 24 league goals and helped guide the club to an improved 13 play finish. The following season then saw Sunderland improve once more, as the likes of Asimo Gian and Stefan Sessegnon added further firepower into the squad. Bruce guided Sunderland to a 10th placed finish in his second season. The following season was when Sunderland started to run into some problems though. As Steve Bruce had delivered back-to-back -back improvements on the previous seasons, the expectations at the club had risen. Bruce was backed with over 28 million to spend in the summer window, with their biggest signing being Connor Wickham, arriving for a reported 12 million pounds. Sunderland would win only two of their opening 13 matches, and Steve Bruce was sacked, with Sunderland sat 16th in the league table. This year would turn out to be a season of change for Sunderland, as Martin O'Neill was installed as Sunderland's new manager, and shortly after his arrival, Ellis Short, the club's owner, became the club's new chairman, taking over from the popular Niall Quinn. Sunderland's slow start to the season ultimately cost them a top half spot, and they finished the season in 13th place. Ellis Short's new role at the club watermarked the next decade which was to come, and was perhaps the first domino in a series of dramatic events. Sunderland had a peculiar start to the 2012-13 season, as they drew six of their opening eight matches. The team then went on a winless run of eight games after January, which left them 17th in the table and the relegation zone gaping below them. Ellis Short made the decision to sack Martin O'Neill, and this is where the fun begins. Prior to his arrival at Sunderland, De Canio's previous managerial career had been spent at Swindon Town in Leagues 1 and 2, and so his appointment did come as somewhat of a surprise at the time. The flamboyant Italian had the desired effect though, and managed to seal Sunderland's survival with a 17th placed finish, which included an emphatic 3-0 win over local rivals Newcastle. De Canio's time at Sunderland would be short-lived though, because despite signing 13 new players in the summer, he was sacked just 5 games into the new season. Upon his sacking, he had plenty to say about the culture at the football club. De Canio told Sky Italy, I did some problems at my experience at Sunderland, but the problem was the board. No rules, no football mentality, no connection club to team, no programmes for the future, players that arrived at training late or called to say I'm in traffic so can't arrive at the training grounds. I wanted British players but they brought players from 13 different countries. If nothing changes inside the club, this will be a disaster for a long time. Plenty of what De Canio said would ring true for Sunderland in the next years to come, and they more than paid the price for a series of missteps behind the scenes which led to a poisonous culture at the club. Gus Poyet took over from De Canio in October 2013. Sunderland looked doomed as they sat bottom of the Premier League table on game week 33, following a five game losing streak, but they somehow managed to turn things around with consecutive wins against Chelsea, Cardiff, Manchester United and West Brom. Sunderland had managed to pull off the impossible and survive once again by the skin of their teeth. Like De Canio before him though, his second season was where things started to go wrong for Gus Poyet. Poyet. After a 4-0 loss against Ashton Villa, Sunderland sat 17th in the table and once again fearing for their Premier League status. In March 2015, Poyet was sacked by the club and the managerial merry-go-round continued. <laughs> Thank you. 
Dick Advocat took over the managerial role in March and managed to guide Sunderland to safety as they finished three points above the relegation zone. So, But still from the beginning I keep saying we stay up. If you believe in yourself, if you believe in your quality what you have, we can do it. Initially, Advocat was only supposed to join Sunderland on a temporary basis and he actually announced his retirement from football altogether at the end of the season. In the end though, he made a U-turn on this decision and returned to Sunderland for the following season, which was a fairly short-lived sequel. In the summer of 2016, Sunderland splashed out on the likes of Fabio Barini, Jermaine Lenz, Yunus Kabul and Sebastian Quartes. But after a poor start to the season, Advocat left the club after not winning any of his opening eight fixtures of the new season. And so in comes Big Sam to save the day, and boy does he have his work cut out for him. Sunderland had been a shambles in their opening eight fixtures, and the competition at the bottom of the Premier League had continued to increase each year. Throughout the entire 2015-16 campaign, Sunderland were never higher than 17th, and they spent over 80% of the season in the bottom three. Somehow, Big Sam managed to pull it out of the bag, as Sunderland only lost one of their last 11 matches, and they finished two points points above local rivals Newcastle to relegate them and survive in the process. I told you we'd do it. <laughs> Sunderland had pulled off another great escape but the alarm bells were going off all around the club with how close they had come to the relegation zone once again. The mood around Sunderland would then take quite a hit as Sam Allardyce left his position as manager to take the England job and Sunderland were once again back at square one looking for a new manager ahead of the new season. <laughs> By this point, Sunderland had been playing with fire for far too long, and the relegation trapdoor was always going to swallow them up eventually. In the 2016-17 season, all of their luck had run out, and there would be no great escape this time around. This was a squad that looked dead and buried from the start of the season, and apart from a few standout performers like Jordan Pickford and Jermaine Defoe, this squad was simply not up for the fight. Sunderland paid the ultimate price for years of poor recruitment and splashing out on lavish contracts for players that were happy to pick up a weekly wage without putting in a graft. The culture behind the scenes had been a disaster for a long time now, and the great escapes they managed at the end of each season was usually just papering over the cracks. David Moyes oversaw one of the worst sides the Premier League has ever seen, as this team picked up just 24 points all season and finished rock bottom of the Premier League. Moyes resigned as Sunderland manager at the end of the season Season upon their relegation to the championship. If Sunderland fans thought things were bad in the Premier League, they were about to get a whole lot worse in the Championship. Sunderland signed 10 new players in the summer of 2017, and they tried to shift on as many big earners off the wage bill as possible. Little finance was made available for Sunderland's restructure though, and it soon became clear that they were in for a struggle once again this season. From dressing room spats to conflicts of interest behind the scenes, the culture at Sunderland hadn't had the hard reset, it was so desperate in need of after their disaster of a season in the Premier League. Jack Rodwell, for example, who was a disaster of a signing to begin with, was on £60,000 per week in the Championship and he had no desire to walk out on that sort of contract. Simon Grayson was ultimately sacked at the end of October as the club had won just one of their opening 15 Championship matches. <laughs> Chris Coleman did bring a bit more charisma into the managerial role, but after a promising start, he quickly ran into the same problems as Simon Grayson. The January acquisitions of Lee Camp, Ashley Fletcher and Ovi Ajaria ultimately did little to steady the ship, as Sunderland finished rock bottom of the championship, having only picked up 37 points all season. The Netflix cameras highlighted just how much was wrong with the club at this time. By this point, it had become clear that Ellis Short was not the right man for Sunderland, and Stuart Donald took over from Short in April that year, as they were relegated to League One, and Chris Coleman was relieved of his duties. <laughs> In 
In League One, under the new ownership, it was clear that the club wanted to head in a new direction, and Jack Ross was going to be pivotal in establishing that new culture at the club. They managed to retain the likes of Aidan McGeady, Josh Madger, and George Honeyman, but League One is no cakewalk. As we have seen the levels in League One continuously growing over the past decade, Sunderland's size doesn't exactly count for much at this level. In January, top goal scorer Josh Madger was sold, and they went in for Will Grigg as his replacement for a reported three million pounds. Sunderland's careless recruitment was what got them into this mess in the first place, and the signing of Grigg turned out to be another high-profile flop, as the striker went on to score just five league goals in 47 appearances for the club. Sunderland finished the season in fifth place and lost in the playoff final against Charlton to a Patrick Bauer 94th minute winner. A real sucker punch for Jack Ross and the new ownership in their first season who were really banking on a first time promotion. Suddenly, the reality of League One had really started to set in. Sunderland's aim was automatic promotion in their second season, but after 11 matches, they were sixth in the table and they took the decision to sack manager Jack Ross. Phil Parkinson was then appointed as his successor, and it's fair to say that he didn't turn out to be the most popular of appointments. During Parkinson's time at the club, the supporters' faith in Stuart Donald and other investors really started to run thin, as hashtag Donald out started trending on Sunderland Twitter. By this point, new investors and buyers were being considered, but the process was long and drawn out. The 2019-20 season was cut short due to COVID, and Sunderland ultimately finished in 8th place as League One was decided by a points per game system, another really disappointing season for Sunderland in the third tier. The following season soon came around and Phil Parkinson struggled to get a tune out of his players. The football was dull, the fans weren't happy and after a run of two wins in seven, he was ultimately sacked in November 2020. <laughs> Lee Johnson was brought in to replace Parkinson and the former Bristol City manager soon got a bounce out of his new side as Sunderland won 11 of their 13 matches from February to April. In the background of their 2020-21 campaign, the ownership fiasco continued to rumble on as several different buyers were being considered and ultimately fell through. After a long and drawn out process though, Sunderland's takeover was finally completed on the 18th of February. EFL have approved the takeover of Sunderland by Kira Louis Dreyfus who becomes club chairman with immediate effect. On the pitch for Sunderland this season it would be even more playoff heartbreak as they went on to finish fourth in the table and lost against Lincoln in the playoff semi-finals. The following season and Sunderland had started their new league campaign well and were well in and around the top two until January. A humiliating 6-0 loss against Bolton then sparked another downward spiral of momentum and the board took the bold decision to sack Lee Johnson with the club sat third in the table. The club ummed and ahed about Johnson's successor and there was quite some speculation that Roy Keane may be in line to return as the club's manager. In the end, the club appointed Alex Neal and what a decision this turned out to be. After slipping outside the playoffs, Alex Neal's side then went on a 13 game unbeaten run at the end of the season and they had their chance for playoff glory again as they went on to finish fifth in the table. They managed to get the better of Sheffield Wednesday in a thrilling playoff semi-final clash and Wembley awaited for Sunderland once more. So after several managers, two failed playoff campaigns, a different set of owners and a completely new squad, Sunderland had finally done it. 
Alex Neal delivered on what he had promised and the championship would be their destination for next season. In the summer transfer window, Sunderland spent over £5 million and they started the season well with results against Bristol City and Stoke. Despite the club appearing to be on an upwards trajectory though, all was not what it seemed behind the scenes. The Stoke job had become available after the sacking of Michael O'Neill and Alex Neal, who had previously been linked with the job, was being considered for the role. To the club's reluctancy, they granted Alex Neal permission to speak with Stoke and seemingly, just as things had started to go well for Sunderland again, they would lose their manager. Since leaving Sunderland, Alex Neal has come out with some interesting indirect comments about what it was like while working at Sunderland. Perhaps we'll never fully know the ins and outs of Neal's decision, but from the outside looking in, it did seem strange at the time. And so that brings us on to modern day. Tony Mowbray is now the manager and Sunderland are back in the championship. It's been quite the wild ride for Sunderland fans over this last decade, I think it's fair to say. And if you did go on to enjoy the video, make sure to leave a like. And if you'd like to see any other videos in this style, do leave your comments down below. Thanks for tuning in though, guys. And I'll see you all in the next one.